Many people think of a king in a negative sense. A tyrant, a ruler, someone who looks down on the people. But people really hit the subscribe button, you know, and the notification bell, because these topics are going to be very interesting. Let's help build our society outside. Today on King Talk, we will be dissecting a book called The Richest Man in Babylon. And we're going to see how this book, we can use it on an everyday life basis in this time, in this day and age. Because I've been reading this book and there's so much insightful stuff that I've applied from this book to my life. So we're going to get into it now, guys. Van Seer, the chariot builder of Babylon, was thoroughly discouraged. From his seat upon the low wall surrounding his property, he gazed sadly at his simple home in the open workshop in which stood a partially completed chariot. His wife frequently appeared at the door. Her furtive glances in his direction reminded him that the meal bag was almost empty, and he should be at work finishing the chariot, hammering and hewing, polishing and painting, stretching taut the leather over the wheel rims, preparing it for delivery so he could collect from his wealthy customer. Nevertheless, his fat, muscular body sat solidly upon the wall. His slow mind was struggling patiently with a problem for which he could find no answer. The hot tropical sun, so typical of this valley of the Euphrates, beat down upon him mercilessly. Beads of perspiration formed upon his brow and trickled down unnoticed to lose themselves in the hairy jungle upon his chest. Beyond his home towered the high terraced wall surrounding the king's palace. Nearby, cleaving the blue heavens, was the painted tower of the Temple of Bell. In the shadow of such grandeur was his simple home, and many others far less neat and well cared for. Babylon was like this, a mixture of grandeur and squalor, of dazzling wealth and direst poverty, crowded together without plan or system within the protecting walls of the city. Behind him, had he cared to look, the noisy chariots of the rich jostled and crowded aside the sandaled tradesmen, as well as the barefooted beggars. Even the rich were forced to turn into the gutters to clear the way for the long lines of slave water carriers on the king's business, each bearing a heavy goat skin of water to be poured upon the hanging gardens. Van Seer was too engrossed in his own problem to hear or heed the confused hubbub of the busy city. It was the unexpected twanging of the strings from a familiar lyre that aroused him from his reverie. He turned and looked into the sensitive, smiling face of his best friend, Kobe the musician. May the gods bless thee with great liberality, my good friend, began Kobe with an elaborate salute. Yet it does appear that they already have been so generous thou needst not to labor. I rejoice with thee in thy good fortune. More I could share it with thee. Pray from thy purse, which must be bulging, else thou would be busy in thy shop. Extract the two humble shekels and lend them to me, until after the nobleman's feast this night. Thou wilt not miss them, ere they are returned. If I did have two shekels, Bansir responded gloomily, to no one could I lend them, not even to you, my best of friends, for they would be my fortune, my entire fortune. No one lends his entire fortune, not even to his best friend. What? exclaimed Kobe with genuine surprise. Thou hast not one shekel in thy purse, yet thou sit like a statue upon the wall? Why not complete that chariot? How else canst thou provide for thy noble appetite? Tis not like thee, my friend. Where is thy endless energy? You see, you hear that? He sat down and he has a chariot to complete. He's sitting down and he don't have any money in his pocket, but yet he wants to borrow money from his friend. Now, is this dude a bad dude for not lending him? Or is this dude a wise dude because he knows what he wants? Because I'm not going to take my last money and give it to somebody. And that is what's wrong with a lot, of, a lot of us these days. We'll take our money because we want to be a good person and give it to someone else. But that doesn't make you a good person. Honestly, no, it doesn't. Let's get back into it. Does something distress thee? Has brought thee troubles? A torment from the gods it must be, Bansir agreed. It began with a dream, a senseless dream in which I thought I was a man of means. From my belt hung a handsome purse, heavy with coins. 
There were shekels which I cast with careless freedom to the beggars. There were pieces of silver with which I did buy finery for my wife and whatever I did desire for myself. There were pieces of gold which made me feel assured of the future and unafraid to spend the silver. A glorious feeling of contentment was within me. You would not have known me for thy hard-working friend, nor wouldst thou have known my wife. So free from wrinkles was her face and shining with happiness. She was again the smiling maiden of our early married days. A pleasant dream indeed, commented Kobe. But why should such pleasant feelings as it aroused turn thee into a glum statue upon the wall? Why indeed? Because when I awoke and remembered how empty was my purse, a feeling of rebellion swept over me. Let us talk it over together, for as the sailors do say, we ride in the same boat, we two. As youngsters, we went together to the priest to learn wisdom. As young men, we shared each other's pleasures. As grown men, we have always been close friends. We have been contented subjects of our kind. We have been satisfied to work long hours and spend our earnings freely. We have earned so much coin in the years that we have passed, yet to know the joys that come from wealth, we must dream about them. Bah! Are we more than dumb sheep? We live in the richest city in all the world. The travelers do say that none equals it in wealth. About us is much display of wealth, but of it we ourselves have not. After half a lifetime of hard labor, thou, my best of friends, has an empty purse, and sayest to me, May I borrow such a trifle as two shekels until after the nobleman's feast? Then what do I reply? Do I say, here is my purse, its contents will I gladly share? No, I admit that my purse is as empty as thine. What is the matter? Why cannot we acquire silver and gold, more than enough for food and robes? Consider also our sons, Vansier continued. Are they not following in the same footsteps of their fathers? Need they and their families and their sons and their sons' families live all their lives in the midst of such treasures of gold? and yet, like us, be content to banquet upon sour goat's milk and porridge. See? You hear what he just said? He said, ain't our sons going to be following in our footsteps? So, whatever you do now, years to come when your child grows up, and they start following behind you, and being exactly what you are, you cannot be mad at them. Because... They follow what they saw. If you had set out a better path, that child would have been something different. That child would have been something better. See, a lot of the times, we think that, oh, because we have the money now, we can spend it. Yeah, the money come right now, we, got, we can spend it. That's what's wrong with our community as a black community. That's what's, that's what's wrong with like, a lot of us as human, as a person who... We want to spend it before we even have it. Oh, yeah, I got 10000 now. If I spend five, I'm going to have five later. So I'm going to spend this five now. Invest that five. And that next five, you hold it back. So if that investment falls through, you can use it again. What, what sense does it make for you to go and spend $5,000 in a club? What are you going to get out of that? Oh, yeah, I'm enjoying my life because I only got one life. Yeah, but what, what about your kids? What about your family? Good. Never in all the years of our friendship didn't thou talk like this before, Fancier. Never in all those years did I think like this before. From early dawn until darkness stopped me, I have labored to build the finest chariots any man could make, soft-heartedly hoping someday the gods would recognize my worthy deeds and bestow upon me great prosperity. This they have never done. At last I realize this they never will do. Therefore my heart is sad. I wish to be a man of means. I wish to own lands and cattle, to have fine robes and coins in my purse. I am willing to work for these things with all the strength in my back, with all the skill in my hands, with all the cunning in my mind. But I wish my labors to be fairly rewarded. What is the matter with us? Again I ask you, why cannot we have our just share of the good things so plentiful for those who have the gold with which to buy them? Would I knew the answer, Kobe replied. No better than thou am I satisfied. My earnings from my lyre are quickly gone. Often I must plan and scheme that my family be not hungry. Also within my breast is a deep longing for a lyre large enough that it may truly sing the strains of music that do surge through my mind. 
With such an instrument, I could make music finer than even the king has heard before. Such a lyre thou shouldst have. No man in all Babylon could make it sing more sweetly. Could make it sing so sweetly, not only the king, but the gods themselves would be delighted. But how mayest thou secure it, while we both are as poor as the king's slaves? Listen to the bell. Here they come. Bands here pointed to the long column of half-naked, sweating water bearers, plodding laboriously up the narrow street from the river. Five abreast they marched, each bent under a heavy goatskin of water. Fine figure of a man, he who doth lead them, Kobe indicated. A prominent man in his own country, tis easy to see. Okay, we are going to end it right there. See, what did you learn from this book? What did you grasp? See, he has a chariot he can complete to sell to one of his wealthy clients. And yet still, he rather to sit down and get lazy and procrastinate about it. Then when he sees his friend, he'll ask his friends for something. See, that's the mentality that a lot of us have. We procrastinate a lot. We hold back. We have so much doubtful thoughts in ourselves that we never reach anywhere that we need to reach. Look at it. God gave you your vision for you to be what you need to be for you. And you tell it to someone else and that person doubts you. And then you start doubting yourself. Your vision is always your vision. Your dream is your dream. It's not someone else's dream. You can't let someone doubt you and you fool yourself with doubtful thoughts. You have to first break that shackle. You can't shackle your hands and shackle your minds at the same time. So when you have your dream that God gave to you, don't tell nobody else. Because guess what? God did not give them that dream. He gave that dream to you. So let's work on ourselves.